Welcome to Games from Folk Tales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This week, The City of Dreadful Night, Part 1. I prep most of this for the stories I tried to write week back in April, and then a plot idea emerged. I was discussing things with Andrew over in the Maginomia Shoestone planning space, and while we were discussing something else entirely, he gave me the key to moving this post forward as part of a workable series of plot hooks for Ars Magica. It might also work for Maginomia, but I need to think about that rather harder. I'm already working on a shadow city for Ars Magica, so a shadow London seems a bite too many. There's a lengthy poem by James Thompson called The City of Dreadful Night, where he lays the nihilism on so thick that people at the time of the publication, which was just after the turn of the 20th century, were impressed by how unremittingly bleak he was. He never lets a crack of hope get in at any point, other than by the occasional contemplation that at least death is the end of all this pain and bother. This may of course seem a bit obvious and played out to modern readers because agnostic materialism is popular now, but at the time he was considered a bizarre bird. He didn't go in for decadence, which was the popular line for nihilists at the time. Later on in the year I'll share his version of Swinburne's Three Ladies, and you'll see that his approach is not opium and debauchery in the face of inevitable death. He'd just like to pick the death that's most pleasant and ask her to get on with it. His angels of insomnia are also awesome and terrible, and we'll see them later in the year. My initial plan was to use a section of the poem each day to participate in posting every day in May, which is a thing that bloggers do, but I don't want to snow my distribution channels with nihilism. My current plan is to take the poem and break it into two sections, describing the plot hooks in each. Unlike other long poems, which I've played then commented on, in this one I'll often be commenting and then you'll hear the poem as demonstration of the idea. City of Dreadful Night is a regio that seeks out sleepers and takes their dreaming selves. It's a nightmare, yes. But worse, it also seems to claim people after death. Having dreamt of the city, you are more likely again to dream of the city. The city is filled with vignettes of hopelessness. I thought it was useless as a play setting because the vignettes are too static. Then I remembered the Hounds of God. In Ars Magica, there's an order of werewolves who annually storm hell and break the place up, stealing the fertility of Earth back from Satan. Why not just let the players loose on the vignettes to wreck the place? To make it useless for whoever's making the city so terrible? Certainly this is a betrayal of Thompson's intention. You are not, as a reader, meant to imagine yourself tracing a sleeper back to Earth and giving him a dose of creomentum spells. You are not meant to imagine a magician putting a net under the bridge over the river of suicides. It might not be entirely in the spirit of the thing to fling pile of fire at the infernal toll collectors at Hell's Gate, but then again, Thompson is dead and expected very little from posterity, so I feel that by disappointing him, I'd give him a sort of grim satisfaction. To skip to the end and to give some structure, there is one creature that may act as a linchpin for the Regio, either as saviour of the people or their oppressor. It's mentioned in the final chapter, so I wanted to give it now as context. A statue of the goddess of Melancholia lies outside the city on the bare northern plateau, so that it's visible much of the time. The narrator seems to find some peace in knowing that others are suffering as much as he is. The goddess is based on a print by Dura, Melancholia one, and yes, the spelling is irregular. There is some debate as to whether he meant Melancholia, or something more obscure. There is a plethora of discussion on this engraving, and I'd suggest you look it up. Much like Dura's figure, the goddess of the City of Night is surrounded by magical and geometrical instruments. She might be a spirit of alchemy, she has the first magic square ever seen in a European print. Also, what I've read as one is a Roman eye, and what the eye stands for is unclear. She may be a guide to the first stage of alchemy, a black stone disintegration. Or this may be a reference to Jura, I as in himself. Or there may be three lost prints for the other temperaments based on bodily humours. There's a very high quality scan available from Wikipedia, which describes the objects in the image. The City of Dreadful Night was recorded for LibriVox by Moon Lilith, thanks to the reader and their production team. The poem describes why he wrote the book. If you say, hey, everything's terrible and pointless, you need to explain why you put your pen to paper in the first place. In Ars Magica terms, it lets you get back a confidence point because it gives you the solace of knowing you are not alone. Reading the book, that is, not the writing. It also seems likely that 
if you have some sort of positive emotional or spiritual virtues, you simply can't read the book. You need to be a melancholy, bilious sort. My question is, if you are a, a melancholy type and you read the book in the real world, does it make the Reggio come for you? Is this, in essence, a seat or doorway for the infernal? Pro -app. Lo, thus, as prostrate, in the dust I write, my heart's deep languor and my soul's sad tears. Yet, why evoke the specters of black night to blot the sunshine of exultant years? Why disinter dead faith from mouldering hidden? Why break the seals of mute despair, unbidden, and wail life's discords into careless ears? Because a cold rage seizes one at whiles to show the bitter old and wrinkled truth, stripped naked of all vesture that beguiles. False dreams, false hopes, false masks, and modes of youth because it gives some sense of power and passion in helpless impotence to try to fashion our woe in living words, howe'er uncouth. Surely I write not for the hopeful young, or those who deem their happiness of worth, or such as pasture and grow fat among the shows of life, and feel nor doubt nor dearth, or pious spirits with a god above them to sanctify and glorify and love them or sages who foresee a heaven on earth for none of these i write and none of these could read the writing if they deigned to try so may they flourish in their due degrees on our sweet earth and in their unplaced sky if any cares for the weak words here written it must be someone desolate, fate-smitten, whose faith and hope are dead and who would die. Yes, here and there some weary wanderer in that same city of tremendous night will understand the speech and feel a stir of fellowship in all disastrous fight. I suffer mute and lonely, yet Another uplifts his voice to let me know a brother travels the same wild path, though out of sight. O oh, sad fraternity, do I unfold your dolorous mysteries shrouded from of yore? Nay, be assured, no secret can be told to any who divined it not before. None initiate by many a presage will comprehend the language of the message, although proclaimed aloud for evermore. There is some note of mystery law here, an area law for the city, perhaps. Characters who want to destroy the city may find a certain satisfaction in learning its law and sealing its mysteries. Chapter 1 lays out the mood and nature of the city. The city is only manifest by night, but characters who visit it do not regain fatigue. The city is a lot like London, but might be anywhere. Its street lamps beam, but the houses are rarely lit. The houses have people in them, perhaps, asleep or dead, but they may have fled. If they are asleep, is it wrong to wake them, or is it better to put others to sleep? Note that the vine of death may be taken literally as of his source. 1. The city is of night, perchance of death, but certainly of night. For never there can come the lucid morning's fragrant breath after the dewy dawning's cold gray air. The moon and stars may shine with scorn or pity. The sun has never visited that city, for it dissolveth in the daylight fair, dissolveth like a dream of night away, though present in distempered gloom of thought and deadly weariness of heart all day. But when a dream night after night is brought throughout a week, and such weeks few or many recur each year for several years, can any discern that dream from real life in aught? For life is but a dream, whose shapes return 
some frequently, some seldom, some by night, and some by day. Some night and day, we learn the while all change and many vanish quite in their recurrence with recurrent changes, a certain seeming order. Where this ranges, we count things real, such as memories might. A river girds the city west and south, the main north channel of a broad lagoon, regurging with the salt tides from the mouth. Waste marshes shine and glitter to the moon. For leagues, then moorland black, then stony ridges, great piers and causeways, many noble bridges, connect the town in islet suburbs strewn. Upon an easy slope it lies at large, and scarcely overlaps the long curved crest, which swells out two leagues from the river marge. A trackless wilderness rolls north and west, savannas, savage woods, enormous mountains, bleak uplands, black ravines with torrent fountains, and eastward rolls the shipless sea's unrest. The city is not ruinous, although great ruins of an unremembered past, with others of a few short years ago more sad, are found within its precincts vast. The street lamps always burn, but scarce a casement in house or palace front, from room to basement, doth glow or gleam athwart the murk air cast. The street lamps burn amidst the baleful glooms, amidst the soundless solitudes immense of ranged mansions, dark and still as tombs. The silence which benumes or strains the sense fulfills with awe the soul's despair and weeping. Myriads of habitants are ever sleeping, or dead, or fled from nameless pestilence. Yet, in some necropolis, you find perchance one mourner to a thousand dead. So there, worn faces that look deaf and blind, like tragic masks of stone. With weary tread, each wrapped in his own doom, they wander, wander, or sit fordone and desolately ponder through sleepless hours with heavy, drooping head. Mature men chiefly, few in age or youth, a woman rarely, now and then a child, a child. If here the heart turns sick with ruth, to see a little one from birth defiled, or lame, or blind, as preordained to languish through youthless life, think how it bleeds with anguish to meet one erring in that homeless wild. They often murmur to themselves. They speak to one another seldom, for their woe broods maddening inwardly and scorns to wreak itself abroad. And if at whiles it grow to frenzy which must rave, none heeds the clamor, unless they wait some victim of like glamour to rave in churn, who lends attentive show. The city is of night, but not of sleep. Their sweet sleep is not for the weary brain. The pitiless hours like years and ages creep. A night seems termless hell. This dreadful strain of thought and consciousness which never ceases, of which some moments stupor but increases, this, worse than woe, makes wretches there insane. They leave all hope behind who enter here. One certitude, while sane, they cannot leave. One anodyne for torture and despair. The certitude of death which no reprieve can put off long, and which, divinely tender, but waits the outstretched hand to promptly render that draught whose slumber nothing can bereave. In the next section, the narrator follows a man because the man seems to be walking somewhere with purpose. He discovers the man is actually walking a ceaseless triangle between three ruins, where he lost three of his virtues. That's not anything a player can superficially do anything about, arguably. He can't even kill the man, because in the city the living and the dead are hard to tell apart, as we'll see later. 
although the city does seem to allow suicide, the man's very like a ghost in Ars Magica circling a final business monomaniacally. The thing the player can do is destroy the triangle. Love's hard to meddle with, but they might rekindle his failed hope using scraps and clues in his former lodging. They might rekindle his faith in the broken church. At minimum, they could destroy the three sites and block the streets to them so that he cannot make his ceaseless, pointless perambulation. They can force the cogs of the clock to stop. 2. Because he seemed to walk with an intent, I followed him, who, shadow-like and frail, unswervingly, though slowly, onward went, regardless, wrapped in thought as in a veil, thus step for step with lonely-sounding feet, we travelled many a long, dim, silent street. At length he paused, a black mass in the gloom, a tower that merged into the heavy sky, around the huddled stones of grave and tomb, some old god's acre, now corruption's sty. He murmured to himself, with dull despair, Hair faith died, poisoned by this charnel air. Then, turning to the right, went on once more, and travelled weary roads without suspense and reached at last a low wall's open door, whose villa gleamed beyond the foliage dense. He gazed, and muttered with a hard despair, Here love died, stabbed by its own worshipped pair. Then, turning to the right, resumed his march, and travelled streets and lanes with wondrous strength, until, on stooping through a narrow arch, we stood before a squalid house at length. He gazed and whispered with a cold despair, Here hope died, starved out in its utmost lair. When he had spoken thus, before he stirred, I spoke, perplexed by something in the signs of desolation I had seen and heard in this drear pilgrimage to ruined shrines. When faith and love and hope are dead indeed, can life still live? By what doth it proceed? As whom his one intense thought overpowers, he answered coldly, Take a watch, erase the signs and figures of the circling hours, detach the hands, remove the dial face, the works proceed until run down. Although bereft of purpose, void of use, still go. Then, churning to the right, paced on again, and traversed squares and travelled streets whose gloom seemed more and more familiar to my ken, and reached that sullen temple of the tombs, and paused to murmur with the old despair, Here faith died, poisoned by this charnel air. I ceased to follow, for the knot of doubt was severed sharply with a cruel knife. He circled thus, forever tracing out the series of the fractions left of life, perpetual recurrence, and the scope of but three terms, dead faith, dead love, dead hope. In Ars Magica, many regions have tempers which are inclinations towards emotional states, or desired actions. The temper of the city, as given in the next section, is living death. It tries to sap away all ability to change or hope. It sucks vitality almost like a dark fairy. 3. Although lamps burn along the silent streets, even when moonlight silvers empty squares, the dark holds countless lanes and close retreats. But when the night its spheerless mantle wears, the open spaces yawn with gloom abysmal. The somber mansions loom immense and dismal. The lanes are black as subterranean lairs. And soon the eye a strange new vision learns. The night remains for it as dark and dense. Yet clearly in this darkness it discerns 
as in the daylight with its natural stance, perceives a shade in shadow, not obscurely, pursues a store of black in blackness surely, sees specters also in the gloom intense. The air, too, with the silence vast and deep, becomes familiar, though unreconciled, hears breathings as of hidden life asleep, and muffled throbs as of pent passions wild. Far murmurs, speech of pity or derision, but all more dubious than the things of vision, so that it knows not when it is beguiled. No time abates the first despair and awe, but wonder ceases soon. The weirdest thing is felt least strange beneath the lawless law, where death in life is the eternal king, crushed impotent beneath this reign of terror, dazed with such mysteries of woe and error, the soul is too outworn for wondering. In the next section, we see that the city obeys Asmagica's tripartite division of the self, but in a terrible way. The self is divided, platonically, into the body, the soul, and spirit. The body is the mortal part, the soul is the eternal part, and the spirit is the part that allows the soul's will to drive the meat, and it becomes a ghost. If one arises, animals have spirits, but they have no souls. That's the 22nd version. Here, a prophet lost in the wilderness outside the city is saved by a dreadful vision. His soul is saved and his body is drawn away. What rests then is therefore what remains of him, his haunting spirit. The characters could perhaps lay him to rest. 4. He stood alone within the spacious square, declaiming from the central grassy mound, with head uncovered and with streaming hair as if large multitudes were gathered round, a stalwart shape, the gestures full of might, the glances burning with unnatural light. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, all was black. In heaven, no single star. On earth, no track. A brooding hush without a stir or note, the air so thick it clotted in my throat, and thus for hours. Then some enormous thing swooped past with savage cries and clanking wings, but I strode on a steer. No hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, eyes of fire glared at me, throbbing with a starved desire. The hoarse and heavy and carnivorous breath was hot upon me from deep jaws of death, sharp claws, swift talons, fleshless fingers cold, plucked at me from the bushes, tried to hold, but I strode on a stair. No hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, lo, you there, that hillock burning with a brazen glare, those myriad dusky flames with points aglow, which writhed and hissed and darted to and fro, a sabbath of the serpents heaped pell-mell for devil's roll-call and some fete of hell. Yet I strode on a steer. No hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, meteors ran and crossed their javelins on the black sky span. The zenith opened to a gulf of flame. The dreadful thunderbolt jarred earth's fixed frame. The ground all heaved in waves of fire that surged and weltered round me, soul 
there unsubmerged. Yet I strode on a steer, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, air once more, and I was close upon a wild seashore, enormous cliffs of rose on either hand. The deep tide thundered up a league-broad strand. White foam belts seethed there. Wan spray swept and flew. The sky broke. Moon and stars and clouds and blue. And I strode on a stair. No hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, on the left, the sun arose and crowned a broad crag cleft. There stopped and burned out black except a rim, a bleeding, eyeless socket, red and dim. Whereon the moon fell suddenly southwest and stood above the right hand cliffs at rest. Still I strode on a steer. No hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, from the right, a shape came slowly with a ruddy light. A woman with a red lamp in her hand, bareheaded and barefooted on that strand. Oh, desolation, moving with such grace. Oh, anguish, with such beauty in thy face. I fell, as on my bier, hope travailed with such fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, I was twain, two selves distinct that cannot join again. One stood apart, and knew but could not stir, and watched the other stark in swoon, and her, and she came on, and never turned aside between such sun and moon and roaring tide, and as she came more near, my soul grew mad with fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, hell is mild and piteous, matched with that accursed wild. A large black sign was on her breast that bowed. A broad black band ran down her snow-white shroud. That lamp she held was her own burning heart, whose blood drops trickled step by step apart. The mystery was clear. Mad rage had swallowed fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, by the sea, she knelt and bent above that senseless knee. Those lamp drops fell upon my white brow there. She tried to cleanse them with her tears and hair. She murmured words of pity, love, and woe. She heeded not the level rushing flow. And mad with rage and fear, I stood stone-bound so near. As I came through the desert, thus it was. As I came through the desert, when the tide swept up to her, there, kneeling by my side, she clasped that corpse like me, and they were borne away. And this vile me was left forlorn. I know the whole sea cannot quench that heart, or cleanse that brow, or wash those two apart. They love. Their doom is drear. Yet they nor hope nor fear. But I, what 
do I hear? In the next section, we see a person awakened from the radio. The key point is that it's not an escape. This break comes only about a quarter of the way through the poem. The players could use this time to find a cure or to break the radio's tether. 5. How he arrives there, none can clearly know. Athwart the mountains and immense wild tracks, or flung a waif upon that vast sea flow, or down the river's boiling cataracts. To reach it is as dying, fever-stricken. To leave it, slow, faint, birth-intense pangs quicken, and memory swoons in both the tragic acts. But being there, one feels a citizen. Escape seems hopeless to the heart forlorn. Can death in life be brought to life again? And yet, release does come. There comes a morn when he awakes from slumbering so sweetly that all the world is changed for him completely, and he is verily as if newborn. He scarcely can believe the blissful change. He weeps perchance, who wept not while accursed. Never again will he approach the range infected by what evil spell now burst. Poor wretch, who once hath paced that dolent city, shall pace it often, doomed beyond all pity, with horror ever deepening from the first. Though he possess sweet babes and loving wife, a home of peace by loyal friendships cheered, and love them more than death or happy life, they shall avail not. He must Dree his weird. Renounce all blessings for that imprecation, steal forth and haunt that builded desolation of woe and terrors and thick darkness reared. 6. I sat forlornly by the riverside and watched the bridge lamps glow like golden stars above the blackness of the swelling tide, down which they struck rough gold in rudier bars, and heard the heave and plashing of the flow against the wall a dozen feet below. Large elm trees stood along that river walk, and under one, a few steps from my seat, I heard strange voices join in stranger talk, although I had not heard approaching feet. These bodiless voices in my waking dream flowed dark words blending with the somber stream. And you have after all come back, come back. I was about to follow on your track. And you have failed. Our spark of hope is black. That I have failed is proved by my return. The spark is quenched, nor ever more will burn. But listen, and the story you shall learn. I reached the portal common spirits fear, and read the words above it, dark yet clear. Leave hope behind all ye who enter here. And would have passed in, gratified to gain that positive eternity of pain, instead of this insufferable inane. A demon warder clutched me, not so fast, first you leave your hopes behind. But years have passed, since I left all behind me to the last. You cannot count for hope with all your wit, this bleak despair that drives me to the pit. How could I seek to enter, void of it? He snarled, what thing is this which apes a soul, and would find entrance to our gulf of dole? without the payment of the settled toll. Outside the gate, he showed an open chest. Here, pay their entrance fees, the souls unblessed. Cast in some hope, you enter with the rest. This is Pandora's box, whose lid shall shut, and Hellgate too, when hopes have filled it. But they are so thin that it will never glut. 
I stood a few steps backwards, desolate, and watched the spirits pass me to their fate and fling off hope and enter at the gate. When one casts off a load, he springs upright, squares back his shoulders, breathes with all his might, and briskly paces forward, strong and light. But these, as if they took some burden, bowed. The whole frame sank. However strong and proud before, they crept in quite infirm and cowed. And as they passed me, earnestly from each, a morsel of his hope I did beseech to pay my entrance. But all mocked my speech. Not one would see the little of his store, though knowing that in instance three or four he must resign the whole for evermore. So I returned. Our destiny is fell, for in this limbo we must ever dwell. Shut out alike from heaven and earth and hell. The other sighed back. Yea, but if we grope with care through all this limbo's dreary scope, we yet may pick up some minute lost hope, and sharing it between us, entrance win, in spite of fiends so jealous for gross sin. Let us without delay. Our search begin. The odd thing about the preceding section is that the spirit the narrator is talking to already has hope. He feels that they together may find a grain of hope if they sift through this limbo, but that feeling would itself suffice to allow him to pass into hell. He's kept in this almost limbo by a misunderstanding or a lie. The box into which the spirits fling their hope is the box of Pandora, from which hope originally came. If you were to find enough hope to fill the box, the hell gate would close. Can the player characters find a spirit of hope and put it in a box? 7. Some say that phantoms haunt those shadowy streets and mingle freely there with sparse mankind and tell of ancient woes and black defeats and murmur mysteries in the grave enshrined. But others think them visions of illusion or even men gone far in self-confusion, no man there being wholly sane in mind. And yet, a man who raves, however mad, who bears his heart and tells of his own fall, reserves some inmost secret, good or bad. The phantoms have no reticence at all. The nudity of flesh will blush, though tameless. The extreme nudity of bone grins shameless. The unsexed skeleton mocks shroud and pall. I have seen phantoms there that were as men, and men that were as phantoms flit and roam. Marked shapes that were not living to my ken, caught breathings acrid as with dead sea foam. The city rests for man so weird and awful that his intrusion there might seem unlawful, and phantoms there may have their proper home. Remember, phantoms can be destroyed with later rest the haunting spirit. In the next section, we see the sin of denying the Holy Spirit, which is a mortal sin. 8. While I still lingered on that river walk, and watched the tide as black as our black doom, I heard another couple join in talk, and saw them to the left hand, in the gloom, seated against an elm bowl on the ground, their eyes intent upon the stream profound. I never knew another man on earth, but had some joy and solace in his life, some chance of triumph in the dreadful strife. My doom has been unmitigated dearth. We gaze upon the river, and we note the various vessels, large and small, that float, ignoring every wrecked and sunken boat. And yet, I asked no splendid dower, no spoil of sway or fame or rank or even wealth, but homely love with common food and health, and nightly sleep 
to balance daily toil. This all too humble soul would irrigate unto itself some signalizing hate from the supreme indifference of fate. Who is most wretched in this dolorous place? I think myself. Yet I would rather be my miserable self than he, than he who formed such creatures to his own disgrace? The vilest thing must be less vile than thou, from whom it had its being, God and Lord, creator of all woe and sin abhorred, malignant and implacable. I vow that not for all thy power furled and unfurled, for all the temples to thy glory built, would I assume the ignominious guilt of having made such men in such a world, as if a being, god or fiend, could reign at once so wicked, foolish, and insane as to produce men when he might refrain. The world rolls round forever like a mill. It grinds out death and life and good and ill. It has no purpose, heart or mind or will. While air of space and time's full river flow, the mill must blindly whirl, unresting so. It may be wearing out, but who can know? Man might know one thing were his sight less dim, that it whirls not to suit his petty whim, that it is quite indifferent to him. Nay, does it treat him harshly as he saith? It grinds him some slow years of bitter breath, then grinds him back into eternal death. There are ships in the river and drays in the streets. There must be manufacturing of something occurring here. The play characters could trace and destroy the city's industry. 9. It is full strange to him who hears and feels, when wandering there in some deserted street, the booming and the jar of ponderous wheels, the trampling clash of heavy iron shard feet. Who in this Venice of the Black Sea rideth? Who in this city of the stars abideth to buy or sell as those in daylight sweet? The rolling thunder seems to fill the sky as it comes on. The horses snort and strain. The harness jingles as it passes by the hugeness of an overburthened wain. A man sits nodding on the shaft, or trudges three parts asleep beside his fellow drudges, and so it rolls into the night again. What merchandise? Whence whether and for whom? Perchance it is a fate-appointed hearse. Bearing away to some mysterious tomb or limbo of the scornful universe, the joy, the peace, the life hope, the abortions of all things good, which should have been our portions, but have been strangled by that city's curse. Here the city perverts the true love virtue, which so often defies the infernal in mythic Europe, by twisting it into idolatry. The players can end this by breaking the tableau somehow. 10. The mansion stood apart in its own ground, in front thereof a fragrant garden lawn, high trees about it, and the whole walled round. The massy iron gates were both withdrawn, and every window of its front shed light, portentous in that city of the night. But, though thus lighted, it was deadly still, as all the countless bulks of solid gloom. Perchance a congregation to fulfill solemnities of silence in this doom? Mysterious rites of dolor and despair, permitting not a breath of chant or prayer. Broad steps ascended to a terrace broad, whereon lay still light from the open door, 
The hall was noble, and its aspect odd, hung round with heavy black from dome to floor, and ample stairways rose to left and right, whose balustrades were also draped with night. I paced from room to room, from hall to hall, nor any life throughout the maze discerned, but each was hung with its funereal pall, and held a shrine around which tapers burned, with picture or with statue or with bust, all copied from the same fair form of dust. A woman, very young and very fair, beloved by bounteous life and joy and youth, and loving these sweet lovers, so that care and age and death seemed not for her in sooth, alike as stars, all beautiful and bright, these shapes lit up that mausolean night. At length I heard a murmur as of lips, and reached an open oratory, hung with heaviest blackness of the whole eclipse. Beneath the dome a fuming censer swung, and one lay there upon a low white bed with tapers burning at the foot and head. The lady of the images, supine, death still, life sweet. With folded palms she lay, and kneeling there, as at a sacred shrine, a young man, wan and worn, who seemed to pray. A crucifix of dim and ghostly white surmounted the large altar left in night. The chambers of the mansion of my heart, and every one whereof thine image dwells, are black with grief eternal for thy sake. The inmost oratory of my soul, wherein thou ever dwellest, Quaker dead, is black with grief eternal for thy sake. I kneel beside thee, and I clasp the cross, with eyes forever fixed upon that face, so beautiful and dreadful in its calm. I kneel here patient as thou liest there, as patient as a statue carved in stone, of adoration and eternal grief. While thou dost not awake, I cannot move, and something tells me thou wilt never wake, and I alive feel churning into stone most beautiful were death and my grief most hateful to destroy the sight of thee dear vision better than all death or life but i renounce all choice of life or death for either shall be ever at thy side and thus in bliss or woe be ever well he murmured thus and thus in monotone intent upon that uncorrupted face Entranced except his moving lips alone. I glided with hushed footsteps from the place. This was the festival that filled with light, that palace in the city of the night. Next week we take a closer look at the inhabitants of the city, at the Cathedral of Night, at the fleeting sign of resistance the narrator sees, and then we leave the city. Your saga may vary.